episode of the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And in today's episode, we have a very special guest, Todd Martin. And I have actually known Todd for a little more than a year from my time at the International Tennis Hall of Fame, where Todd is the CEO. And uh, you know, during that time, during those 14 months I was working at the Hall of Fame, Todd and I had a number of discussions about the mental side of the game, um, where we talked about both his experiences as a player um, and the, the wisdom on, on you know, the mental side of tennis that he had accumulated uh, throughout his career. And uh, I know everyone will really enjoy uh, this episode and hearing more about those experiences. Um, so Todd was a professional, a highly elite professional player, uh, reaching number four in the world. Um, he reached the finals of the U.S. Open and the Australian Open and was a member of the U.S. Davis Cup team that won the championship in 1995. And currently, Todd is uh, still very engaged in the tennis industry and the CEO of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. And I know everyone will really enjoy this episode with Todd Martin. So we'd like to welcome Todd Martin to the podcast today. So thanks for coming. Hi, hi Josh. On. Well, thanks for uh, joining us today, Todd. Um, so we'd like to start off um, in a way that we generally start off these conversations um, by telling us a little bit about how you got introduced to the sport of tennis. So I, uh, I was in Ohio, Northeast Ohio, when... Um, from the ages of one to 10 and my parents were both, uh, uh, athletic, uh, my dad, a, uh, a high school athlete in a few different sports. And my mom, uh, my mom had her master's in phys ed and health education and was a former phys ed teacher. Tennis was sort of their place to find uh, common recreation. And so I, um, at an early age, I enjoyed being around uh, them. They didn't uh, want to get a babysitter just in order to go and play an hour of tennis. So I'd chase them to the park. And if I behaved well, dad let me play a little home run derby afterwards with the tennis racket and tennis balls. And yeah, I got, that was probably when I was about four or five and got um, pretty obsessed with um, all sports, basketball and tennis the most. And um, but you know, tennis was easier to, uh, it was, was pretty easy to do, uh, by myself, you know, hitting against a garage or whatever and, um, fell, fell in love pretty quick. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, at what point did you start to, you know, take the sport more seriously, whether that, you know, in terms of training more often, in terms of getting into, uh, the junior tournaments? Well, um, I don't love the term training because I didn't start training until I was probably 20 years old and a professional. Um, you know, I prefer uh, practicing. I think about, um, you know, receiving instruction, which is much more educational than it is uh, a form of training at a young age. Uh, so, you know, the first few years I played only in the summer, uh, considering we were in the, in, in the northern midwest and then um uh probably around eight i started to do some uh do some group instruction uh throughout the throughout the school year as well a couple times a week in uh uh at a program uh near kent state university and then uh, when I was 10, my dad got transferred to uh, Lansing, Michigan. And that's when, um, you know, that's when I, it was a nice opportunity for us to narrow my areas of focus. I was playing Little League baseball, Little League soccer, skating, some playing, um, playing tennis, playing a ton of basketball. Um, so you name it, I was doing it. When I got to Michigan at 10 and in the fifth grade, I narrowed to just tennis and basketball. And that's when I started competing a little bit more regularly. I, you know, but I have, even in Michigan, I have memories of playing uh, novice tournaments. So it wasn't like I was at any um, pr progressed level of, uh, of, pr uh, of, uh, 
participation at that point in time. Got it. Got it. Um, so, at what point, at what point during during your childhood, or during your development, did did you start to think that um, you know college tennis could be a possibility? Um, it's also interesting. I mean, we've we've talked to a lot of you know our, our other guests about the, the, some of the benefits of playing multiple sports growing up. So um, it's interesting, you know, as, as you talk about playing all these different sports, and you know, in addition to playing basketball um, regularly growing up. But at what point did you start to think about did did, um, did it go from playing in um, you know more as you say novice junior tournaments to this possibility of playing at the collegiate level? Uh, so I was probably 11 when I started to really, um, set an objective for being able to play, um, collegiate, uh, athletics, not specifically tennis necessarily. So I was, um, you know, I was, I was hopeful. I, I had visions of playing basketball for Bobby Knight at Indiana. Um, and I had, um, you know, the one college program I was aware of was SMU, who were coached by Dennis Ralston. Um, so, you know, I had those uh, ideas in my mind, but they were, you know, they were dreams slash objectives. Um, and, but, but they were, you know, I was committed to working towards it. Just, you know, it wasn't like um, I had any clue that that could possibly be assured. Um, by the time I, I, probably by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was at that point where if I, you know, if I didn't mess it up, uh, tennis was, college tennis was a, was a probability. And that was, that was pretty, that was pretty clear. I was, um, my second year of 14s, I was in the top 50 in the nation and, um, um, and I, you know, I, I just from a physical development standpoint, I knew I had a, a long ways to go with um, taller parents. And, you know, uh, I was tall, but I was a, uh, just a total string bean and didn't didn't have a muscle uh, to uh, to claim. So I, I think at that point in time, I was it was pretty clear that if I didn't get injured or if I didn't lose my way, that I would be able to play college tennis. Um, it was also pretty clear that I would not be able to play basketball for uh, Bobby Knight at Indiana. So, Awesome. Um, and, and I guess one other question is, can you tell us a little bit more, and I think this will, this will lead to um, maybe the bulk of the conversation that we'll have, but if you could tell us um, some about the, the coaching that, that you received during these days and how um, some of the, the coaching, some of the lessons that were imparted to you um, as a junior um, through some of your coaches or through some of the, as you say, practice you were doing back then, um, maybe how that contributed to your career as a tennis player. Yeah. So in Ohio, um, I was taught by a fellow named Ted Sawyer. And um, Ted is uh, in South Florida, still, still in the business. But Ted uh, established a really... Uh, good technical foundation for me um, combined with my uh, proclivity for other sport. Um, you know, so I, I think I had uh, a, a natural understanding of um, not necessarily a natural ability to be athletic, but a natural understanding of athleticism. Uh, and he, you know, he, he combined that with an emphasis on developing uh, sound technique and um, and fundamentals uh, with with tennis. So that was a really good combination to start off with. I moved to uh, Lansing when I was ten, and it was a one it was a one shop town with essentially one tennis pro in town, and that uh, that was Rick Furman. Uh, Rick is the best educator I've ever been uh, in um, the company of. He was a classroom educator, left the classroom to um, get into the tennis business. His uh, his educational background included intramural 
sports uh, administration. So he was both, um, you know, he was both an expert in educating the individual, but he was also an expert at, um, um, at group education and facilitating the, the development of sport. Um, Rick actually um, moved on after, you know, long after I left uh, Lansing, he ultimately became the executive director and chief operating officer of the USTA. Um, so, you know, from a, from a, you know, a singular club uh, managing director to being responsible for um, basically all things tennis in the U.S., um, you know, it's total dumb luck that I was, uh, that, you know, that my, my dad got transferred to a place that um, I'd be introduced to somebody so influential. Um, my program, if you will, from the age of 10 until I went to college at the age of 18 was, um, you know, nine months of the year during the school year, my parents uh, allowed me to play three days a week. Um, uh, two of those days were two hour group clinics, which were basically, a, a, a four player to one court ratio. So, you know, typically 15 or 16 kids on four courts. There were a lot of good tennis players in Lansing because of the, of the culture Rick had developed. Um, so I was usually, um, uh, I was usually looking up at my peer group and until I, you know, until I was sort of in that 16 to 18 uh, year old range. So it was really helpful for me to always be in the middle of the pack um, and not needing to look very hard to find somebody to beat me up. Um, in, in addition to those two, two hour classes, I would also have an hour private lesson with Rick once a week. And if um, if I was organized, I would be able to square away an extra hour after that private lesson to have a hit with a friend. Uh, during the summer, I was a total court rat. My parents would drop me off, you know, basically Monday through Friday to hang out at the hang out the hang out at the courts and do camps or scrounge up uh, sparring matches. Uh, and then, you know, I competed with some regularity in um, in the district of Western Michigan. Um, and as I got older, more and more across the entire Midwest section. And, um, in my second year of age groups, I was competing nationally in the first year of age groups. I was typically not qualifying to do so. So Todd, I'm curious about your, um, sort of, uh, how much match play you felt was important to your development as a player, um, you, you and I are actually similar age. I'm a little older. Uh, you know, in my recollection of the time around the late seventies, early eighties was, a, you know, a little less professional sort of academy environment, which we may have more of today. Um, and, and more of, um, playing a lot. I also played with a lot of adults, um, and got in, you know, so I was, I was playing matches all the time. And, um, and I'm just curious if that was a part of your experience, um, you know, as a junior player growing up and then, you know, getting into college. So it was, uh, that was an element, um, of Rick's program, which was really, uh, w which was really healthy. I, I don't remember the regimen, but, you know, it was at least once a month where we would have an organized match play where, you know, the kids in our group would be, uh, asked to come in tournament gear, you know, sort of tournament mindset, yeah. uh, to, to have a, a formal match play. And there are probably times where it was more frequent than, than that as well. And then I, I did compete a lot. So, you know, those six hours a week that I talk about, um, would probably be, um, disrupted at least once a month, uh, you know, probably one and a half to two times a month, uh, with some tournament, uh, you know, weekend tournament stuff. So, um, to me, I think, uh, 
we are oh our developmental uh pathway these days are it, it's way too many repetitions because it just turns the mind numb and um if you look back in time at the great players that uh played in the 70s and 80s and even to a little bit of a lesser degree the 90s um in my in my uh peer group there was a lot of sparring there was a lot of a you know let's scrounge up our own game let's uh, you know i heard that you know there's a new accountant in town that plays really well or played in college and you know get matched up with a 40 year old when you're 15 there's a lot of lessons to learn about how to play against different styles. Uh, you know, playing adult tennis is much different than playing youth tennis. Um, learning how to interact with adults was really beneficial. Um, we didn't always have a, a great pack of adult players to lean on, but there were times where um, where there were opportunities for us to do that. And that was, uh, you know, I think uh, a va of value, but the, you know, the 20 hour a week on the court stuff is, um, it from, for my liking is for the birds. And, um, and I think the, the biggest issue is that it just saps the passion for the game uh, out. And, you know, it, doesn't necessarily sap it out for the kid who's 15, but if the objective is for the for the for the young person to be uh, really successful at 25, sustaining that level of output through adolescence and young adulthood, man, it's it's pretty easy for that for that flame to be extinguished. Yeah, and that's a good topic, right? Because I think. Very often we talk about the need to be motivated and that that's certainly important, but um, motivation doesn't necessarily imply commitment. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you have some thoughts about how those two things work together and the, and the importance of, of commitment in order to, to reach a high level or to you know, reach your own personal potential. So there's, you know, there's words like commitment and devotion and dedication. Um, at, at the end of the day, I think it all comes back down to focus, um, it, it, focus and passion. And, and if, if, if you're passionate about something and not passionate about uh, watching it or, you know, reading the newspaper or, you know, studying the statistics of it. But if you're really passionate about uh, an objective or a dream, which it was more a dream of mine than it was an objective until later in, in my childhood. Um, if you're passionate and you're focused, I think that's, I think that's the recipe. Um, it's pretty easy to, um, especially now, nowadays. And, and, and granted, I, the, the amount of distractions that I had as a child and as a, uh, even as a professional tennis player are nominal compared to what uh, youth and professional players face today. Yeah, great. Um, but there was never a moment where I um, felt like I had lost my passion and there were just a couple of moments that I can point to in my career where uh, I didn't go to bed not thinking about wh who I was playing the next day. You know, I stayed awake. I, I lost sleep because I was so excited about the challenge that was to um, be before me the next day. I was not going to sleep counting sheep jumping the fence <laughs> i was going to sleep playing points in my mind um playing a point playing points against the opponent that i was that i was due to play next um that was a level of focus and in some ways maybe obsession that um that i was able to manage to be still healthy um and i think it's 
I think it's what is more common among uh, athletes that excel. They, they, they certainly learn better and better how to compartmentalize their, their lives. But when they need to be focused on the sport, it is not, uh, it is not a, a, a requisite or it's not a, it, it's not a burden. It is an opportunity. It's like, oh, good. Now I get to focus on what I love to do. Um, and and I, I think if you're not from Eastern Europe or Asia, where children still in some ways are responsive to a, a more authoritarian upbringing, be it from a parent or from a coach, um, I think you're playing with uh, you're you're playing with fire with the 20 hour a week mentality because it's just it's just not sustainable for the typical for the typical American uh, child. I don't think. No, I, I think that definitely makes sense, and I think the the differences in culture um, between the way that a, a kid in the U.S. grows up and, as you said, you know, different parts of the world, Eastern Europe or parts of Asia, um, makes a big difference in in terms of, you know, how they would respond to, to that sort of training. Um, so when you mentioned your own, um, w w when you mentioned it going from practice to training, um, somewhere around the age of 20, um, was that, was it, was it something about college tennis, your time at Northwestern that, contributed to that shift or what, 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 what made you sort of, um, flip the switch and, you know, and, and, and go from that practice to that training and really start to take things to the next level and ultimately into your professional career. Yeah. The, the, the easiest answer is, uh, the availability of time. First of all, um, you know, trying to, trying to do school, um, traditional school and still, I mean, like even in college, we only practiced 10 hours a week. Um, and then we would compete on the, on the weekends. Um, so it was still, it was more, uh, college was more of a time for me to become more self-reliant on the education element. Um, uh, on court education and, and really learning the sport without having uh, without having Rick be the the information provider always. Um, and then when I turned professional when I was twenty, I uh, the USTA um, uh, assigned me to uh, Jose Higueras, who at the time was one of the three pillars of the. Uh, player development program for for young professionals, and so um, you know Jose's methodology is um, is different than what I grew up with. Um, my time with Rick was really discussive. Uh, it was analytical by you know talking about the game. Rick understood that I didn't have time for the repetitions. My parents wouldn't allow me. To uh, in a good way, they wouldn't allow me to just be at the courts all day every day, um, and so I really had uh, I really had to learn the game through analysis and study, uh, as opposed to you know let's just throw another hour of um, ball feeding at you one day or the next. Um, so Jose, um, you know Jose's methodology is based on having the time to dedicate to it and rather than uh, being hyper analytical about technique or uh, you know about certain strategies he applies things through challenging you to do certain things physically or do or make the ball do certain things so um, there is a you know there's there's a lot of um, there's a there's a there's a much easier way to describe Jose's um, uh, work as being training. It, there's it's highly educating. Um, in fact, uh, I think he's 
the best that there's ever been. Um, you know, I don't have enough of a sample size, but I, you know, I, I learned, I learned so much about how to play the game, how to play the game on the other side of the net through Jose, you know, looking at it. Cause at that point in time, you know, I needed to, I needed to learn how to spin my forehand better. I, le- I needed to learn how to slice, slice the backhand better. Uh, in spite of Jose growing up on clay courts and playing a counter punching style, he helped me a ton understanding how to play the net and how to volley better um, as somebody who was always attacking the net. Um, but, you know, a, a large part of it was getting me to understand that the really important part of competing at, at the professional level was figuring out how to play against the other guy and so you know the puzzle solving was on the other half of the court not obsessing about how does my forehand feel today or how come I can't hit my backhand down the line uh, as well as I did yesterday that stuff was um, that stuff was practice however um, the real learning that we were doing was about how to play the game and that you know, and that took the rep- that took the repetitions. That was not all just film study and like let's look at, you know, how Joe plays and you know figure out how to get how to get into his head. Um, so I think that was a very natural. Uh, it was a necessary, not even natural. It was a necessary step in my own uh, education as a tennis player. I needed to get to that point where I could build the physical reserves to be able to play five best of five sets um, and also understand the game better at a, uh, at a sensory level, you know, feel the game and not just think the game. Uh, and that was a, yeah, it was a, it was a perfect time and a perfect transition for me in educational methodology. Yeah, it really speaks to the value of, of experiential learning, right? You know, if we think about deep learning, it's usually really three phases, you know, gathering information, then experiencing and taking action on the information, and then then thoroughly reflecting and analyzing, you know, how your experiences went. And, uh, you know, that's, that's some of what I'm hearing, you know, in terms of your work with, with Jose Agueras, as well as, you know, understanding... Uh, yeah, how to play the game, understanding that tennis is a combat sport and you need to be focusing on on breaking down that opponent, whether it be physically, mentally, both. Um, you know, Jorge Capistani, uh, the, the coach, tennis coach in Michigan, talks a lot about uh, tennis IQ and that being level three or pro level tennis IQ is under understanding what's happening on that other side of the net. Um, and then, you know, really learning how to... to you know, deal with the, the opponent. Um, when did you see this start to really come to fruition for you, Todd, as you went through this learning process? You know, at, at what age or at what point um, did, did the pieces start to fall into place for you? Well, in, in childhood, um, you know, I was so uh, uh, underdeveloped physically that, you know, it just... I took it on the chin a lot because I was six foot three and, you know, 42 pounds or (laughs) or, or so it would have looked, um, you know, but, but my game was organized. I had, you had good technical foundations. I understood how to compete. Rick was, uh, a closet sports psychologist before sports psychology became a thing really. And, um, so, you know, the, the education of, the body as far as how to function and the education of the mind as to how to analyze and compete started at a very young age. Um, And the most important thing that Rick uh, probably did for me was the the notion that everything was a positive and it wasn't um, false positive. It was uh, in, it was, informed positive uh takeaways from failure so um you know i'd take it on the chin and you know one of those takeaways was yes but 
you know, uh, look at you, you're six foot, he's six foot two and 42 pounds. And look at the other guys, you know, five, 10, 165 pounds. You're not supposed to compete at 14 with this kid. Um, but you know, let's look at how much you controlled play in spite of that. Let's, um, let's, let's see how many times you were able to attack that player and get to the net. Uh, and you know, something from that data would, uh, he would be able to draw a positive conclusion from as an opportunity for me to get better. And he constantly reminded me, you know, looking at my parents, my mom was five, nine and athletic. My dad was six, two and a half, six, three, and was a football, you know, as a lineman in, in, in high school football. So, you know, I wasn't destined to be a pipsqueak forever. Um, and he, he, he did, he did a good job of reminding me that. And, um, you know, I probably, when things finally started to connect, I was ranked, uh, as, sad that I remember this, but I was ranked 28 my second year of 16s in the U.S., but my, and I had never gotten a ranking in the first year of an age group up to that point in time, and then my first year of 18s, I was ranked 18th in the U.S., so, you know, not only did my ranking go up, but it was in, a, it was in an aging up uh, period, uh, and it was directly correlating to my physical growth um, and, and, and maturation. And then again, in college, I, I didn't stop growing until I was probably 20 or so. And in college, the same sort of thing. My, my freshman year, I, sort of, I, I felt like I struggled. I did just fine, but I, I felt like I struggled. And then, you know, made massive steps in my tennis between my freshman and sophomore year. And a lot of that is, you know, the sort of the final finalization of my physical growth and the, and, and clearly the uh, emotional growth and independence that is developed in those, uh, in those first couple of years at college. Um, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting to hear about how um, both through college and through, you know, your junior development, how, um, and then I guess also going into the beginning of your professional career between working with Rick um, and working with Jose, how that contributed to, um, you know, this, this transition from practice into training into be really becoming a professional. Um, as, as you, you started that process of, you know, playing in professional tournaments and working your way up the ranks, uh, how did some of the, the earlier learnings um, from Rick and, and, you know, from, from your time at, at college, uh, how did that contribute to uh, your growth as as a professional player? Well, um, patience was one of the most important things for me when I started my professional career, um, and I didn't necessarily have a ton of it, but um, it was certainly challenged. Um, I was, I don't know, I was pretty close to two years out of college and still um, really struggling, you know, a smattering of decent results here and there. And, um, and then some moments of greater levels of consistency, but, uh, without any momentous successes in there. So sort of losing second round a lot, losing, you know, uh, beating players maybe that weren't great, losing to players that were really good and not, you know, just not having uh, evidence of the work paying off and not um, not having the material results uh, reinforce my confidence. Um, there was enough uh, there was enough self doubt to where I thought that um, you know I would I would probably you know go back to school after a couple or three years of trying to trying to play. Um, and there was a moment where I. Um, my agent said, you know, your, your contract is, uh, is with the agency is coming up and it was a two year contract. And I, my response to him was, Hey, listen, I totally get it. Cause you know, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to do this on my own. I, I know 
um, I know I've uh, underperformed or whatever. And, um, you know, his response, um, uh, not many, not many people should associate agents as being um, good for their development as athletes. But uh, his response was really helpful for me. And that was, this is, this is an investment by the firm and we're still really confident. And there was something about uh, the tone of his response uh, and the content of his response that was, that stays with me to this day. And, gives me the, you know, gave me the notion that I was on the right path, um, even though there wasn't specificity as to what, what about the path was right. But then, you know, not long after that, I had, um, I had a, I had a couple of results in a row that, um, that were momentous for me. So, uh, I think it was, yeah, February of 93. So I was two and a half years out of college and I made it to the finals of the tournament in Memphis, which, which was a large tournament. I, I beat Michael, uh, well, I beat David Wheaton, my, Michael Chang, Andre Agassi, and then lost to Courier 7-6 in the third in the final. And that was, um, to call that a unique result, is an understatement and um but it it was sustained so it wasn't long after that maybe a month and a half after that i won my first tournament uh which was on uh, on clay um my first tour level uh tournament atp tour level tournament um and then you know by the end of july i was in the top 15 in the world and what I really, what I really came to realize was that I had been doing all the work that I needed to, that, um, uh, that I had placed the trust in Jose to lead me, uh, the best way I could be led. And, you know, eventually it clicked and I gained the confidence to marry with, the skill development, the, the understanding of the game, the, you know, the, the strength of, you know, strength of body, the strength of mind. And those, those things finally clicked in me. And then I, you know, and I was able to sustain uh, a level of excellence for, you know, for several, for several years before I, uh, before I knew, I, I got outmatched by the young buck. Well, I like the story about the agent, Todd, because um, it reminds me, we, we recently had David Samuel, who's a coach out of the UK, works with a lot of ATP, WTA level players. And he observed that there are a lot of players out there who seem to quit just before when he thinks they're about to make a breakthrough. And, um, you know, you were encouraged to keep going, and and then, as you said, it at a certain point, it it did end up clicking, and it, and I I realize that that's got to be hard as the player, um, especially if perhaps as you noted earlier, the passion and the focus aren't quite where they need to be to kind of get to that to that click moment. So I, I really like that story. I think that's something that um, listeners can really take to heart um, about you know continuing on the path along because because things yeah, Brian, I, go ahead just, no I, i'll just say you know it's really important that you associate that with the passion and focus um you know these are recollect recollections of mine 30 years later um so you know make sure nobody goes fact checking my conversation with my agent but <laughs> the you know the the the, the real fact of the matter is that um, deep down inside of me, I had a undying passion. My notion, my, my cognitive or intellectual thinking of, oh, woe is me, you know, it's, I'm probably not that far away from going back to college, um, was, um, you know, that's easy to say. Uh, but for the the real fact of it was I still had an 
undying passion and a and an obsessive focus on reaching a level of excellence at this game that um i was i was experiencing self doubt in so um the the reality um or the potential reality of me going back to school it was not material it was you know just one of those immature thoughts of somebody who wanted to have some gratification for the work that had been put in um it, had i overdone it in childhood and i underdid it in, in childhood so don't you know so I, I think if i were to do it again i would have been at the court four days a week uh through high school and not three days a week that type of thing I, I could have I could have done more and still sustained that level of passion but if I if I had overdone it it would have been just immeasurably more difficult for those things all to click uh in order to have the success because my heart just would have been broken that much more my, um because I because I would have exhausted some of that passion yeah, and I appreciate the clarification on that, on that, Todd. And and you're right about sort of the, sort of the over effort piece, right? Because that can often lead to to burnout, exhaustion. Um, you know, which burnout is really kind of like physical, mental exhaustion. It can lead to decrease in that, that focus and passion. And so it is a, it's a difficult balance to figure out. Uh, and, and as you said, maybe in your junior career, um, could have done. Maybe you yeah, there was capacity for more, but then there's also the danger of, of, of overdoing that. And then that's, I think, something everybody has to figure out on their own of like, what what is my capacity here while I can still maintain a healthy fo- focus and passion on, on what I'm trying to do? And I think that applies to probably lots of contexts in life. I, I, would, I would agree totally. And I think the, you, you know... Um, the the you know the nuance there is if you're grading your passion and your resiliency on the day can i get through today sure i can get through today will i want to come back tomorrow sure i'll want to come back tomorrow but we don't always understand or have clarity on what today's actions will have four years from now or 10 years from now. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's where um, our uh, junior development uh, coaches in all sports uh, have to be really, have to be really careful because yeah, the, the kid loves to play, loves to play. Yes. That's great. It's a kid. It's a 15 year old boy or girl. There's, you know, they don't know what else to do. But then when other things get in the way and they see, well, I get more satisfaction from going to the movies with my friend or tooling around on social media, then all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a compounding uh, deficit that builds in that passion over the course of time. So you do have to have vision uh, both in how an athlete is going to develop positive, positively, but and and you know technically, strategically, whatever. But you need to have an understanding of you know how 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 many withdrawals from the from the uh, from the the athlete's uh, passion and focus bank account can you make and still have funds left in that, that proverbial bank account when you're, when you're down the road? I think it's really easy to be short-sighted and say the kids, you know, the kids holding up physically, the kids still showing up and, and trying hard in practice, but you don't know what the long-term effects are going to be on that. Um, and I think there's just tons of evidence of kids who, um, had a lot of things going for them uh, and things didn't pan out for them because I think at the end of the day, they get exhausted um, 
uh, not physically, but exhausted with the, you know, the determination to come back and get the next day, get the next day's work in. No, that, I, I think that's that's a unique perspective, and I think, uh, as you said, maybe at, at points during your your junior development you undertrain, but I think you know, if you look at most of the kids growing up these days that are really at that, you know, aspiring to to play at that elite level, they're on the other other side of things. Um, I guess I guess one question, yeah, um, I was just going to say how how would you encourage you know those that are maybe along that pathway to start to find a little bit more balance or start to, you know, to keep something left in the tank, knowing that it's a long journey to, to ultimately get where they want to, where they want to go. So I think that, um, I think one of the, uh, great bits of literature that, um, is misinterpreted is, um, the 10,000 hour concept. Um, you know, I, at one point in time, I think I did the math and, and figured out that I had gotten to 10,000 hours worth of tennis somewhere in my, you know, early to mid twenties. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of youth, uh, a lot of parents and a lot of coaches think about that 10,000 hours and, and think the faster we get to 10,000 hours, the better. Um, now I didn't have 10,000 hours on court, but I probably got to 10,000 hours of physical, athletic competition and um, uh, learning at an age earlier than most people because I was playing football in my neighbor's backyard or basketball in their in their driveway. I mean, I was constantly going. I was constantly learning how to do other things athletically. And so um, I didn't have the, you know, the over repetition injuries growing up because I had hit 4 million forehands in the course of a week. Um, but I learned how to move my feet playing basketball, both on an offensive and a defensive side of the ball um, that uh, clearly has a tra uh, translation into tennis. I played soccer. I, you know, I got, if I didn't have any, if I didn't have anybody around, I was juggling a soccer ball or juggling a tennis ball regularly. Um, you know, there's, there's all of this um, you know, in a formal, in a formal, formal terminology, cross training that we used to do as, as children, that doesn't happen in this day and age. It happens more in Europe and South America than anywhere else. I mean, you can't find a, a successful professional tennis player from Europe or South America that doesn't know how to play soccer brilliantly well i mean it's really hard to find and so you know the tennis courts are right next to the soccer the soccer field and they're constantly doing it so with us you know that's just not the way we behave um and i think that's i think that's one of the attributes where um we have figured out how to fall behind uh the competition I think the other thing with uh, the 10,000 hour roll and, you know, to be clear, when Malcolm Gladwell popularized that, you know, building on the work of Anders Ericsson, he, he really oversimplified the concept for everybody, right? If you read Ericsson's research, the hours could be from 4,000 to 40,000 and they included a lot of different things other than just practice. But I feel like sometimes when we look at that 10,000 hour rule, we start treating athletes whether they're younger or, or or even in their adult years like they're machines which they're not um right there needs to be the concept of rest and recovery and you can't just have somebody practice four or six hours in a row and expect quality expect learning um you're actually yeah. probably going to get um low quality you're going to get burnout you're going to get a lot of different things and so i think you're right that that 
the popularization of that concept has been probably more harmful than anything, you know. But when you say maybe you reach 10,000 hours in your 20s, to me, that sounds right about where it should happen, um, you know, because we're talking about mastering a sport that is extremely difficult, not only in terms of the technical aspects to learn it, but also how to play the game. You know, and you were mentioning earlier, Todd, about how it really wasn't until you started to experience, you know, working with Jose Higueras, where a lot of the how to play the game stuff really, really began to click for you. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of different experiences that I think go into the 10,000 hours. And, and sometimes we even throw a practice too much. You know, to me, playing matches is part of your yep. 10,000 hours. Um, it's not just about, you know, oh, for drilling. Sure, for sure. For sure. I mean, if you're not, uh, if you're not counting match play or comp or formal competition, uh, or I would say sparring or formal competition, you're selling yourself short. I mean, that's, that's, apt. I mean, to me, everything we do, uh, from our schoolwork to, our spiritual development to how do we interact with our parents to uh, what lessons uh, do we learn from watching our friends make good decisions and bad decisions? Who are we hanging around with? All of it contributes to the development of the athlete. And um, so you, you just can't discredit anything. And so that's where my parents determination at uh, at, at, in, in their son's per, uh, perception at times a little bit overboard, uh, but they were determined to raise an, you know, an all, uh, a well-rounded child. And so um, I didn't get as much tennis as I wanted, but it's like not letting the kid get as much Halloween candy as they want, not letting them eat 50 pieces a day. And, like candy tastes better once, once every, you know, once in a while. Right. You know, the, the, the overall pathway has, it has to be respected. It's so, it's so easy. I mean, um, it's so easy to get, uh, uh, sucked in to what others are doing. And for me, I grew up in a decently small town and it was more beneficial for me to compete against the best athletes in town on the basketball court and then the best athletes in town on the soccer field, the best athletes on, in the town on, on the baseball field. And then, you know, and then I, you know, and then I take my lumps, uh, on the tennis court. The, um, uh, Brian, I'm impressed about uh, Erickson. That's uh, that's good that you know that. There's a there was a project done by the USTA years ago. Um, it was done, I want to say, by their then chief medical officer Brian Hainline, um, and it was a, a tennis, the ideal, the ideal youth sport, or something like that. There was a product, and I actually spoke about character development um, as a uh, as an attribute of building um, um, or helping develop uh, a, a successful youth athlete. Well, I think, I think the, other... the reason I say that is I think I think Erickson uh, presented at the at the conference. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, and I think you know what part of Erickson's research that I think should be played up a little bit more in tennis circles is is what he did in his study of, you know, elite chess performers. And, you know, he looked at the difference between, um, you know, chess masters versus others. And there were two key differences there that I think we can learn from as tennis players. One is these, these elite level chess players, they played more games and the quality of their moves in games were stronger because they played more. And secondly, they studied the game more than others. Um, and those are two, yep. you know, when we're talking about match play, that that's one aspect of it, right? But even getting into more of the study of the game, watching the game, understanding the game, these are things that are completely accessible to players today. And and talking about the game, 
And, you know, like going to dinner, um, you know, Jose laments now, you know, um, I hope, hopefully he won't get mad at me for saying it publicly, but, you know, he, he, he gets discouraged when the players aren't going to dinner and talking about tennis. He like, you know, like, this is a great opportunity. This is when we're going to learn. This is a, this is an opportunity to get better without sapping energy, without sapping uh, those hours, if you will. Um, and because, and that when I talk about passion and focus, that's a lot of it is when I, my first French open, ironically was my best ever French open. I qualified and made it to the fourth round and, you know, nobody, nobody would recognize me outside of my own house. So I'd walk around, I'd watch all my buddies play. I, I would have played first match one in, you know, four sets. And I'd spent the rest of the afternoon at the venue at Roland Garros, walking around, watching matches, sitting with coaches. I was trying, you know, and it, it was partially because I was a fan and partially because I was trying to absorb how to play on a foreign surface, which it was for me. And, um, you know, that it, it was, it was the incessant study of the sport. It, in my developmental years that allowed me to succeed when I, you know, ultimately was ready to succeed. And the other thing is when, um, when you talk about competition, uh, although I wasn't succeeding as much when I was 30, 31 years old, I was a better player at 30 or 31 than I was at 24 when I was fifth in the world. I mean, it's, you know, I was still getting better day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out. No, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense that through, through your experience and through it, I think particularly through all those, you know, the, the countless hours of, of learning about the game through your development and talking about it and analyzing it, that that ultimately led to, you know, a higher level of, you might say tennis IQ or, um, understanding of the game. Um, one a question that I have, and this is actually based on some conversations that we've had in the past, um, is th this concept of mental toughness in, in tennis. It's it's a concept we've talked about a lot on the show, um, but I know that you have you know a, a certain way of, of breaking it down into into different elements. Um, I was I was hoping you could share share some of that and, and how you conceptualize it. So, um, you know, I think it's, there are a lot better people to talk about mental toughness and the, you know, let's call it the academic side of sports psychology in general than, than I, but, um, you know, the way I have framed it, um, in, you know, in my conversations with young athletes, um, regardless of sport is there there needs to be a there needs to be a balance um sort of it's almost like a three-legged stool and the legs need to uh remain in in balance one of those one of those legs are um just all of the things that an athlete can control uh within the from a day-to-day -day standpoint so uh for me it started with attitude and effort and then evolved from there, focus being one of them, um, and, and, and plenty of other, um, attributes that at the end of the day, if, if you underperform on those, it, it's, it's on you. Um, you can't always control your forehand, but you can, uh, you can work pretty hard at controlling your attitude and how, and how you respond to adversity. Um, the the second component or second leg on the stool uh would be uh perspective and that is um you know the idea that this is really important to me uh, i want to do my very best but also understand that it's it's not life or death and no matter what happens on the court today um uh, the sun is going to come up tomorrow and I'm going to have to figure out how to do my job better or as well 
tomorrow. Um, you know, our families are still going to love us. There, there are certain things uh, that are far greater of far greater importance than winning or losing this singular um, this singular match. Uh, and then the third, uh, and I think it ties the other two together, is uh, a level of self awareness. And um, you know that self awareness to understand when you're losing perspective either losing perspective, um, uh, taking it too seriously, um, putting too much pressure on yourself, or uh, giving yourself a pass uh, be, and, and not caring enough, not putting enough, uh, uh, not putting yourself on the line enough in that competition. Uh, and also then, you know, where where is my attitude? How how am I processing? You know, point in and point out, and performing what I should be able to control. And I think you know, I like that model. I like the three the three legs there. And I think uh, something that's helpful though for athletes who are hearing that model and and understanding how to apply it is that you know the journey towards this kind of like self knowledge and self awareness is an uncomfortable journey. It's going to have its ups and downs. It's going to have successes and failures, and um, it's constantly, you know, striving to keep those three things in balance. But also recognizing that there are going to be times where where they're not in balance, and 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 trying to get them there is, is going to be an uncomfortable process. But uh, hopefully, the reward and the purpose that you're playing for is is worth it to you. You say it better than I do. That's uh, I couldn't agree. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, it is, uh, it's absolutely critical that, uh, that people understand, um, and, and granted it's sensationalized, uh, in, in a way, but Michael Jordan didn't make his JV basketball team. Like, you know, like he's the greatest, in my perspective, the greatest basketball player athlete period that I've ever witnessed. And here's a guy who, who failed at one point in time. And, um, you know, he was determined not to let that derail him. Uh, you know, a, a day's failure, a week's failure, a month's failure, a year's failure is not failure. It's, uh, it's a way to get better if you look at it the right way. I mean, I, crazy example. I walked into a, uh, I walked into a place this morning and Bob Ross, the artist, was on the television there and and i said i said to the person working at this at this at, at this business i said oh my gosh bob ross and i said i love bob ross and she, and she said yeah what what's his what what are his words it there are no mistakes just happy accidents and you know if if we could approach life with the notion that it is all part of the journey and you're going to figure out how to make a, what you deem a mistake into a happy accident. Uh, boy, I mean, we'd be better athletes. We'd be better humans. We'd be, you know, just there's so much to learn there. Well, I think Jordan is, a, is an athlete I love using, especially with tennis players, because not only did he fail to make his, you know, his high school team when he was a sophomore, but he also talks about failing to or failing at game winning shots over and over again. Yeah. Um, but that leading yeah. to the success, right? And and the key element I think of Jordan doing that was he even when he was early in his career he had the courage to take the game winning shot even though he knew there was a risk of failure. Um, and and I think that's something in tennis sometimes we don't see enough of is the the expression of courage as a virtue like in a crucial or a clutch moment. Can you play with courage rather than playing with fear? Because if you play with courage and you lose and you make you make a mistake, you still are getting closer to coming through in that clutch moment later on. Um, and so I think you know Jordan's a great lesson on on multiple fronts. And and I like to use courage as a virtue with with players, um, just so that that's how we're approaching the game. Because like you said earlier, Todd, you know nothing terrible is going to really happen. Um, you know, your parents are not going to put you up for adoption or, or whatever. 
Um, you know, you're, they're still going to love you, etc. So why not play with courage? Why not try to go out there and, and do the right thing, knowing that eventually that's going to click? I couldn't agree more, and I wish I could have practiced it a little bit better when I was playing. There were moments where I, um, um, and I don't know if it was necessarily a lack of courage, but, you know, um, there was a there was a distraction element for me at times that um, I think would manifest themselves in a way that resulted in not playing with a perceived level of confidence and, you know, uh, of that courage. I always had the courage to go back and, and, and fight another day, but I, I did struggle at moments uh, in the match, um, you know, going, you know, going all the way, if you will, or whatever that, you know, whatever that means, but going all the way. Um, but I think it is, uh, I think it's, it is one of the most admirable qualities of any great athlete is, um, the notion that they would rather be responsible for their own fate than not to be um you know the the idea of hoping or wishing for your opponent to miss um or or um you know needing a a, a teammate to take the shot that that uh for me i i never had that and that's uh i think that's i think that's probably a contributing factor to how i got to where i did get is because i was at least uh, excited to have the opportunity. I didn't always perform when I had the opportunity, but I was excited to have the opportunity. I, I think that's that's a great perspective that a lot of that, that all of our listeners can, can learn a lot from. Um, as as we start to to wrap up um, the conversation today, Todd. I mean, we want to be respectful of your time. Um, I guess, do you have any any? you know, last thoughts about um, sort of the, the state of tennis today, maybe in terms of how things are, have changed or in terms of, you know, certain players that, that you enjoy watching, either based on, you know, some, some physical attributes or mental attributes um, related to our discussion? Well, I, uh, I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think I'm terribly unique in, in enjoying watching Daniel Medvedev play. I think, um, he uh, he demonstrates a thoughtfulness uh, and a, a, a level of discipline that's just remar- remarkable. Um, I, I I I watch I watch him play, and I and I see um, I see thought process uh, almost invariably. Um, you know, there's there's the occasional moment where he sort of loses the plot uh, mentally a little bit, but he understands his game. He understands the game and he understands how to play each and every opponent that he plays. You know, like when he played Nadal in the finals of the open, uh, when he lost to Nadal, right. That was 19 maybe. Okay. Yeah. So when, when in that match, uh, first of all, it was an amazing demonstration of respect because Nadal started changing things up early in the match. And, you know, at the, by the end of the match, they were both serving and volleying some. They were like, I don't know if Daniel Medvedev had ever served and volleyed in his entire life. And at a certain point in time, he figured out that if he was going to compete, it was not about doing what he was best at it was about doing what Rafa didn't want him to do. And, um, you know, you talk about courage, that's courage to, you know, to put your less than best cards on the table, but trust that those are the best cards that you can play against the guy uh, on the other side of the net. There's so much, and this is a complaint that I have, and I don't like to sound like the old guy who, complains about his sport, but um, I I cannot stand to watch Rafa Nadal beat somebody 6-2, (laughs) 6-2. 
um, or 6362. Rafa is spectacular, and I love watching him play. But for somebody to go out and just hit ground strokes with him for an hour and a half and take it on the chin, 6262, out of fear of losing 6160, because they're taking some risks and trying to actually compete that, that infuriates me. I would, I would much rather watch somebody get absolutely shellacked by them than to just slow bleed it, um, playing their normal game. Uh, and I, and that's where I look at somebody like Medvedev who is willing to play the game the right way against whoever he's playing. I think that's, um, uh, I, I, the other guy that I look at right now is um, Fitzipas. Um, you know, the look in his eye, um, I think he has to, I think he has more to navigate around than Medvedev. You know, Medvedev looks pretty casual in his focus. However, you know, he's super focused. Uh, Tsitsipas has got a little bit more of um, you know, uh, he's got to pump himself up and, you know, uh, almost feign some self-belief in there, but he does it awfully well. He's got a, he's got a David Ferrer look to him as far as, uh, the next, you know, the next point is the most important point of my life. And I, I, I like, I like when you can see that. And I and I and although I think he's trying to pump himself up and you know cover for some things that maybe he's less proficient at, uh, I look at it and think to myself, this guy is he's there to he's there to fight, he's there to play every point, and um, and then there's the gold standard in Rafa. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Todd. Uh, I think that was that was really an awesome conversation. I think you know, I, I know that our listeners got a lot out of that. Um, so, so thanks for thanks for joining us today on the Tennis IQ podcast. I've enjoyed it. Happy to talk about it. Well, that was a great uh, conversation, Brian. Uh, one of the one of the my biggest takeaways was how Todd said that growing up, he maybe wasn't playing on court as for quite as many hours as some of his peers or quite as much as uh, some of the you know elite junior players are playing today. Um, but what that allowed him was that maybe extra bit of um, passion or energy. So later on in his career, he still had that urge to take things to that next level um, and didn't get burnt out as we see with, you know, far too many players uh, these days. So I, I think that was something that, that definitely stood out to me. Um, what about you, Brian? What were some of your biggest takeaways? Well, I would agree about that, that piece not getting burned out. And, and Todd mentioned that he had this sort of great reservoir of passion and focus for the game. And that being uh, a requirement to to succeed at that level, um, so I thought that was uh, that was interesting because uh, you know we will often call things like that motivation and commitment and you know certainly passion is, is part of it and I think you know motivation and commitment are are part of it and finding that right blend for everybody so you can stay stay focused. You know we talked a lot about competition and we you know we even discussed some of Anders Ericsson's research about playing more games and studying the game. And, and I thought it was very interesting how Todd said that, um, you know, Jose Ogaris, who worked with Todd um, early in his professional career, sort of uh, laments the fact that players today, at least that he's working with, they don't talk about tennis as much. And it's really, if that's actually happening, that's a missed opportunity to study the game more, to talk about the game more. Um, I think, you know, as we know, Josh, it's it's not just about the strokes. It's about how you compete and it's learning to win the game. You know, one of your favorite books, Brad Gilbert's Winning Ugly, a lot of that is about learning to win the game, win win games and win sets and win matches. And that takes study and then that takes a, a lot of repetition in, in playing through competition. So I thought it was really good to hear a, a player, you know, a former player, uh, obviously somebody who's had a ton of success speak to those those topics right um because i think they are important not only for 
uh, young players, but it's great for coaches to hear that. It's great for parents to hear and understand those points, right? So, well, I know Josh and I would love to, uh, you know, thank Todd Martin again for coming on to onto the show. I want to thank you all for listening. For more on today's episode, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions for me and Josh, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com or you can use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check us out on Instagram. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.